All right, and we are live, and I'm truly honored to have a guest who is a legend. Now, I say legend from time to time, but Michael Levine is quite literally a legendary DEA figure. You have had countless arrests. You've been all over the place. Um, you've been in a, shall we say, both the darling and the um, enemy at different points in your career of governmental agencies. Is that a yes. fair assessment? Very fair. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And how are you doing today? Well, I give today a seven out of ten, Eric. Uh, okay, good. I don't want to. You know, we could do the rest of the show on the problems I've had in the last week, but when you think about it, it would be totally boring to your audience. So, <laughs> perfect. Let's try to bump it to an eight. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see as we go. Now, just to start everybody off, because okay, you have such a long story career. There's a lot of things there, and I'm going to try to cherry pick or whatever to get stories. Your stories are incredible. But to start you off, from what I understand, your law enforcement career really kind of kicked off over a hat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it was a near-death experience. It was covered in a book that's very hard to get now uh, by Donald Goddard. And the book is called Undercover. And I was making so many, many arrests that the New York Times wrote an article uh, called Acting on a Deadly Stage in 1986. And the Drug Enforcement Administration at that point gave me credit for 3,000 or plus arrests. There were actually more, but it, that's not really what was important. What was important is that they sent, the New York Times sent a writer to DEA and they wanted to meet an agent and interview an agent who didn't just go under, undercover. I mean, the ASPCA has undercover. Uh, every, everybody claims undercover. Undercover is when you're face to face with your target. You're at his mercy and you're trying to seduce him out of his life. You're literally acting for your life. And a lot of DEA people, friends of mine, died for bad acting. That was about it, bad acting. Well, uh, they gave a, a, a writer, a New York Times writer, uh, the authority to go ahead and write the article, acting on a deadly stage, because they wanted someone who went into other countries using fake passports and lived in other countries unarmed, living with drug traffickers, and successfully seduced them out of their lives. And in New York at the time, there were 500 agents and, and policemen and I, I was actually, at that time, the only one who had actually done that. And it gives you the idea is to, to accentuate what it is, under what really, I call it deep cover when I wrote the book, deep cover, because I wanted to differentiate this from undercover. You know, under, it's oh, a lot more true. than putting, well, how did I get into that? Incredibly risky, incredibly risky, high stress, uh, tense existence, started when I was in the United States Air Force in 1958. And uh, I was stationed at Plattsburgh Air Force Base. And I was on a heavyweight boxer on the boxing team. And uh, I bring this up because it's part of the issue. I was the only white man on the boxing team, Plattsburgh yeah. Air Force Base. The other issue that becomes important in what I'm about to tell you is that Plattsburgh was one of the few places in that year, in those years, that a an African-American soldier coming back with a white wife from Europe could be stationed. You couldn't mm. station him anywhere. Plattsburgh was one of the few bases that would it would work. I mean, they'd be protected. And uh, there was a semblance of normalcy for the guy and his family. So the issue was very, very hot. Memorial Day, 1958, we have a parade. And I was a dog handler. And that's a big deal. You get all dressed up and you go out on the streets and you march with your dogs. It's kind of, they're really kind of, uh, really impressive, you know. And, and I was very much impressed with myself. And I thought that, uh, you, you know, and a typical guy, a typical 18 year old at that time, I didn't think anything could kill me. 
I was 227 pounds, heavyweight boxer. I wasn't a good boxer, but I was a white boxer, which to my black coach, that meant a lot. He used to come to me and say, you got to turn pro. And his name was Reggie Matthews. I said, Reggie, <clears throat> I said, if I turn pro and you're my manager, <clears throat> I'll be the first white Jew in history to have a black manager boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, could, I couldn't do it because I just got hit too much and I knew my brain would not last too long. But this all has context in the issue that happens between me and a guy named Haywood. Haywood didn't have a hat for the parade. I had two hats. So I told him I'd sell him my hat for $3. Now, $3, you think, wow, what's $3 now? But $3 in 1958, you could pretty well get drunk all weekend. Well, weren't well, you paying $6.50 a month? Oh, uh, no. We, we, I was paid, I think my pay was $40. $42, $42 a month. And when it, after taxes, <laughs> yeah, what do you think was left? So uh, I agree. Haywood and, he, and I shake hands. He's going to give me $3 before next payday. Well, next payday rolls around. And then the payday after that. And now we come to a Saturday. And Haywood and I are in the barracks. And I ask him about, what, Haywood, what about the $3? And Haywood starts to come at me with all this Jew stuff. You Jew this, you Jew that, you Jew that. And I couldn't get involved with that because all my friends were on the boxing team. I'm not gonna, I wasn't into that anyway. I grew up in the South Bronx. I didn't, I really was one of the people who did not see color. But this guy was bringing up Jew this, Jew that. We ended up agreeing to fight in back of the barracks that night. And of course, Given the conditions, given the situation, uh, there were uh, several hundred people in back of our barracks. They made it into a racial thing, which I never wanted. You know, I, I, in fact, I was hoping that he would weigh about 156 pounds. I was 227 pounds. I, I wasn't the best boxer in the world, but I was good enough. You know, you, I was trained. You know, he was not going to do much. And so I was hoping he wouldn't show up. And he didn't. And then I started shooting my mouth off, just calling him a coward. And then forgot about it. He showed up, I figured he's too afraid or, or whatever. What does an 18 year old think of that? And uh, Hayward doesn't show up. Now at the time I was taking uh, an English course at Plattsburgh State Teachers College, which was off base. And my roommate, Richie O'Hara and I had two college, college girls with us and we drove across the ramp on Plattsburgh to the dog kennels where they kept the sentry dogs. And we showed off with our dogs. Now we're coming back and we're going through a security gate. And who was on the security gate but Haywood? He waves me out of the car. I, I see this, it is a lot of years ago, I see this like it's yesterday and I always will. I, I, probably to the day I die, I'll still see this. And, uh, I get out of the car, Haywood squares off with me, and he slaps me. But I could see the slap coming. I don't even duck it. I let him hit, I let him hit me. He slaps me. I go with it, and I start to I see, you really want this? You're going to get it now. And I start to move in, and he steps back, pulls his gun, and aims it at the mid, mid, uh, mid body, pulls the trigger, and it doesn't fire. I didn't hear it click. I didn't. I, I, I thought maybe he didn't fire, but he pulls the gun, points it at me, and I back off. I just don't want him to pull the trigger again. We had four witnesses. Got Haywood arrested. I'm brought into uh, lieutenant. Huh? Was Haywood, was Haywood an MP as well? as well? Yeah, he was. Air, he was. Air, we're air police. He was also. He was. He, like I said he was. We were in the. We were in the barracks. Our, you know, the air police barracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what Haywood was doing there that day because uh, he was married and living off base. In fact, part of the deal was when Lieutenant Kelly, our lieutenant, called me in and he said, they called me Levi. He said, Le Levi, he said, we're air police. We saw, we, <clears throat> we saw this within our own. Now, you don't have to do that. He said, you could, you could press charges. He said, but if you don't press charges, I would rather you didn't. Let us solve it. Let us not get out. And he said, if you 
agree not to press charges, Haywood is going to be on the next plane to Greenland for a year, break up his family, the whole thing. And uh, of course, I agreed. Again, you know, I, I had no, this was not real yet to me, Eric. It was, it, it was too otherworldly what had just happened. And I didn't know how close I really came to death, but I came close enough where the reality of that old Arab saying, any moment is the right moment to die, really struck home. And the reality also of how long you're going to live. You know, people dying all over, young, you know, 30s, 40s, dying, and I, you're just not promised another minute. So how much are you going to waste your life treading water? How much of you are you going to waste your life doing really what you don't want to do? How much, how much of that precious time are you going to waste? And I, I go from the uh, Air Force. I get a college degree in accounting. I'm now married. Uh, I, have a, I have a child, my son, Keith, who would later be shot in the streets. <clears throat> my son, Keith, became a New York City policeman, but then he's just a baby. And this also becomes part of this story. Uh, my son was shot. Uh, he had a, a gunfight with uh, people. They were robbing an ATM machine, and he was chasing one. And the guy turned and fired, and the bullet hit my son right where the bullet should have hit me. That he would fire, and I could never. I can't ever. I can, this moment, even talking about it, I can't really shake it. it it's it's just in me, and uh, it it shakes me up. It makes me question stuff over and over and over. But it gets worse, or, or, or stranger, stranger yet. I decide, uh, I, I was graduating with a degree in accounting, make another long story short, I decided, uh, somebody gave me a pamphlet, US Treasury Law Enforcement, I said, I'm going for that. I would rather do anything than be an accountant. Even though I'm graduating with a degree, I just, I, I, can't, I can't spend hours of this precious life sitting behind the desk, I can't. I wanna live. I want to experience things. I want to go with different women. I want to see different countries. I want to, and you're not going to do it as an accountant, but I'm listening to a radio show one night while I'm still a senior at Hofstra. And uh, by the way, working as a bartender and a saxophone player, which was more fun than, a hell of a lot more fun than accounting. And <laughs> Almost everything is, that's a long long. Yes, that's the point. And uh, a radio show, one of these all night talk shows, guy talks about James Bond. He says, there's no, he says, CIA doesn't do that stuff. He said, the reality of CIA is the agents, the, the officers do nothing. They hire informers. They hire traders. Those are the guys who do the undercover work. But the CIA agents, they do nothing that you see in the movies. He said, there's only one U.S. federal agency that really travels the globe and fake passports and lives with uh, the opposition, lives with their targets and seduces them. And they live a James Bond kind of life. He says, that's the federal narcotic agents. And my, my brain kind of switched and I said, that's what I want to be. I don't know how. And I ended up becoming a, a, a DEA agent but not only a DEA agent, but an undercover. It was a, a small group of us that were called undercovers. And that's all we did. We, we were doing four, five, six, eight cases a week. They, send, they would send me overseas to pose as Mr. Big. Uh, I, I'm bilingual, I speak Spanish and English. So that came into play. So how did I get into this? It was a bullet that didn't fire. In 1973, I'm already a DEA agent. To, hide, to uh, emphasize this, I'm in the bullpen under the federal courthouse in uh, Manhattan, Southern District, where the, the bullpen was a basement, big basement, cavernous basement room full of cages where we kept prisoners before they were arraigned. And that's full of marshals. And in those years, 90% of the prisoners arrested federally with DEA. And we, when um, I'm down there in this crowded, noisy place and I hear somebody yell, that's the luckiest MF in the world. And he said it again, loud, screaming, and everybody's looking and he's pointing at me. And then I realize who he is. He was Jimmy Smith, my air police sergeant. 
And he came over and he started telling me what happened. And I didn't even know. He said, they took, you know, Hayward was shocked that he, he didn't shoot you. He didn't kill you. He was shocked. He said, when they took the gun from him, they test fired it. It fired every time. The bullet was struck where it should have gone off, but it didn't. And nobody had an answer for that. And okay, that just made uh, the whole incident ironclad, uh, diamond clad. It's just here in me. It's part of me now. It's what made me. Uh, it, 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 it's in my mind instances where uh, I really had to contend with the fact that I might die. Yeah, that instant, it was there. Whatever. You, you know, and I can't even tell you exactly how, but it's there. It's there all the time. So I hope I answered your question without rambling off. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Um, I'm getting um, an I'm echo. Getting echo. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering can you turn it down a little on your side? I'm on on my side? Let me see. Uh, yeah, I think I can. Let's see if that, see helps. If that helps. That's a That's little lighter. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, though. Let's see. Uh, I, it is How's sounding that? better. Uh, this is How's much that? better. Good. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, I still hear myself, but I'll, you know, go with it. Um, I want to skip forward. One thing that I cover a lot, or I've kind of backed into covering on the channel a lot, is the CIA and shenanigans. Um, everything from Hollywood to the news to family members to it, it's just crazy. Uh, MK Ultra, the, the, there's so much stuff. Yeah, a little yeah. sprinkling of FBI thrown in. Oh, a lot of FBI. Yeah. <laughs> I was a supervisor of FBI agents for a year and a half. Yes. Ah, okay. The FBI I wanted the task force. Yeah. I wanted to jump because you had talked. Uh, you kind of had some bad experiences with the CIA or, or their actions going yeah. all the way back to um, I think it was Bangkok that you were yeah. working a case and they were importing drugs, heroin into the country in a specific way. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the way the case, the way the case started is we arrested, I was in the hard narcotics smuggling unit at the time was 1971 going into 72 and uh, the Vietnam War was still raging because this becomes kind of important. And I uh, I get called from my, from I, I was on what they call uh, call out. Uh, that means if anybody's busted at the airport smuggling, uh, I was called out. And sure enough, it's on the 4th of July, I get called and I rush out to JFK airport and they arrested a fellow by the name of John Edward Davidson. Davidson was arrested with six kilos of, no, three kilos of heroin in false bottom suitcases. He made a long statement. The customs guy had taken it down and it was all BS. He said that some, somebody in Thailand had told him uh, that it was jewelry or, or powdered gold or some such thing. And he didn't, had no idea it was heroin. And... I looked at his record. He was a uh, combat GI. He had seven trips into the U.S. Uh, and basically told him, look, John, I have nothing against you. Said, but if I catch you in one lie, I said, I'm going to go after you and you're going to get life in prison. So you better tell me the truth. And I, I picked up a phone and I made a fake phone call to somebody allegedly in Bangkok investigating everything on this guy's passport, the hotels he stayed in. And, and in the middle of it, he said, I'll tell you the truth. He said, I have to make a phone call. I think it was 10 minutes to midnight before midnight or the uh, financier of this whole operation will run. They know if I don't call in by midnight, I've been busted. And he did. And he said, he calls, he's speaking to a guy um, Alan Trupkin in Miami in a luxury trailer. No, not uh, Trupkin was in Jacksonville. Sorry, and Trupkin immediately gives himself up on the phone. He says, 
man, we were, we were scared. We were wondering what happened to you. We, we were going to cut. We were going to leave. What? So, no, 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 I got, I got, uh, and, and uh, Davidson starts to act. You know, he says, no, no, I got hung up. The airport did this and that, and, and Trumpkin believes it. And he said, when can you get here? And, and, and Davidson looks at me, and I tell him, I, I mouth, next flight. And sure enough, we got on the next flight to Jacksonville. We, and by the time we got to Jacksonville, had a caravan of, of agents and cars following us to, uh, to this location in the middle of a swamp where, where uh, John Davidson had a luxury trailer in the middle of a swamp with telephone service, everything, all piped out there. Only, the only kind of expense that a heroin dealer can, 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 get, can do. Out we go. And he ha he's in the trailer. He calls up uh, Davidson. He says, "I'm here." And and he says, "But I." The Davidson says, "I forgot." I uh, uh, Trumpkin says, "I forgot how to get out there." And and then another guy gets on the phone, and he says, "I can show him." And they, and John said, "Don't, don't. You don't have to come. Don't come." He's telling the other guy, and I put my fist in front of him. I say, "No." So okay, you can come. So Trumpkin comes along uh, with another guy whose name will come to me. It's true. It's a shame I can't think of it right now. Uh, they show up. They come to they all the people that are covering me. I'm hiding in the trailer. They all of that all the guys outside back their cars into the swamps. They were hiding in the in the swamp grass, and I'm in this back room of this trailer. I turn on a little. Like, is there somebody with you by chance? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, there's up there with an talking. army, but nobody no, can no, be. No, I, I hear somebody talking in the background. Oh, let me close the door. Hold on. That's that's <laughs> my wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> she's in, she's two rooms down. I'm surprised you could hear her. Sorry, my friend. No, no worries, no worries. I just I was okay. like. <laughs> so, I I was anyway. I'm there hiding. And I, I I left a tape recorder rolling under the under the bed, and and Trupkin and the other guy come into the and they start talking about the drugs and how it could and I'm getting all this conversation is being recorded on my tape recorder, and when he when he says it enough I'm supposed to give three clicks on the, on the portable and they move in all the guys, I give the three clicks and I hear a crash. The crash was. One of the guys that came down from New York with jumping up and his head going through a planter on the side of the thing. And they brought him into the trailer to make the arrest. And he was half unconscious. He laid on the floor. Everybody came in and arrested uh, Trupkin and, and, and fake arrested uh, John Edward Davidson and arrested this, this third guy. And I come out and... I start talking to you know Davidson. I, I said, "Look, you guys, uh, you're, you're small stuff. I, you know, I, I really I want to get who, where you, this dope comes from." And of course, Trumpkin says, "I have no idea." Davidson is the guy who, who actually got this stuff, so he can he can identify the connection. The third guy, he basically was a junkie. And he, he, they gave him heroin to run errands. And that's all he did. And this becomes important. They all get arrested. Uh, Trumpkin is not going to talk. He gets one of the best lawyers in the country to, to, uh, to, to represent him. Got big money. I learned from, the, from uh, John that he was bringing in three kilos a trip for seven trips, same group, same people, same source. And that he was making, he would get three kilos for 6,500 and he would gross, they would, they would cut it, break it down to ounces and sell it all over the country. Uh, the three kilos would net close to a million and a half dollars. So th yes, that was, that, was, that was the economics. It would net these guys close to a million and a half in cash in those years. Wow. Uh, so this in that time was a very significant 
case. It was huge. Uh, I got a Treasury Act award for the case. Because you didn't hear the half of it yet. Davidson agrees to introduce me to the to the uh, source in in uh, Thailand, a guy named Mister Ge, and and uh, Yuk Bui Yi, and Liang Se Tu. And these were the, these were the two young Chinese guys living in Bangkok, but they were traveling back and forth between Chiang Mai and uh, now you now we're into the route that the U.S. government didn't even know about. This, the uh, Chen United Army trafficking tons of, of uh, heroin or, or op uh, opium, uh, crude gum opium, which was turned into heroin from the Chinese border to Chiang Mai, where it was converted into heroin and shipped all over the world. These people, by the way, and I didn't know this yet, were the ones supplying the heroin that was being smuggled into our country in the bodies of our dead GIs. All of this would come out in investigation, but at this point, I didn't know that yet. Um, I, my boss, Al Seeley, says to me, do you want to go there to Bangkok and meet the, meet the source? He said, you're going to be on your own. There was a war at that time going on between DEA and uh, actually the hard narcotic smuggling group of, of customs, the White Powder Squad, and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. War for turf, for glory, for war. funding. Yeah, it was a war. So we couldn't tell them that I was coming there. <laughs> it's crazy, right? But I had to go, I had to travel there on, a, on, a, on a, my tourist passport and they couldn't know. The only guy that knew I was there at that point was Joe Jenkins, the customs agent, the U.S. customs agent in charge, and he was my only support. And if you go out on, you, uh, on YouTube and wherever on my website, you'll see photos of me meeting these guys, making the first contact and, and negotiating large heroin shipments. Okay. They... I, I do my job, and in my job is I made them trust me. I made them like me. I made them believe that I could take large amounts of heroin and distribute them in the U.S. And they want to, now they want to impress me. So they invite me to Chiang Mai, to what they call the factory. This was by far the biggest case that our government had ever seen or heard of factory producing hundreds of kilos of heroin a day. It was, the seizures of heroin in the United States were like one kilo, three ounces, six. That was a great case. That's where we were. Mentally, uh, our sophistication ended there. We didn't know re the real size of drug trafficking. This was one of the first glimpses into really what a monster it was. All of a sudden, I tell Joe Jenkins, I, I want to go. I want to go up to Chiang Mai. I'm going to see the factory. This is what I'm here for. At the time, my brother was a, a, a heroin addict. He would later commit suicide. So I was, I believed in all the rhetoric. I thought, wow, how lucky I am. I'm really doing God's work. I was totally crazy, you understand? But I believed it. And, and uh, all of, suddenly, I'm no longer getting financial support. The money is not coming through. I can't pay my hotel bill. These guys think I am the tutti frutti of the mafia from the U.S., and I'm having trouble coming up with cash for anything. And I have no idea what the problem is. I'm talking to Joe Jenkins. He has no idea really what the problem is. Then I'm starting to make noise. You know, other government agencies are hearing me. I forgot exactly how I did it, but I wasn't keeping my mouth shut. This wasn't going to go, I wasn't going to go away silently. You're killing this case. Whoever is stopping this money is killing the case. And I just wanted to identify who was stopping the flow of money. It's like an army that suddenly the, the flow of supplies is gone. You can't fight. You what, can't fight. what year was this, by the way? This was 19, the, the events that I'm talking about happened in 1971 into 1972. So it's pre-DEA yeah, 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 yeah. two agencies. Uh -huh. So it's pre-DEA. Oh, just pre. Just pre. I was 
I was with the, again, the hard narcotics smuggling unit mm -hmm. of U.S. Customs, which was one of the greatest jobs you could imagine. And we, they, we were subsequently absorbed into DEA in 73. And the rest of my career was DEA. But we're still back before DEA. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's what happens. I'm called into the embassy. Joe Jenkins calls me and he says, go out about two in the morning tonight. Should get you to, you, you walk. He says, cut, make sure you're not followed. Just take every precaution you can. Make sure you're not followed and come into the embassy. He said, take your time. Someone wants to talk to you. And he wouldn't say more than that. And I do that. And now I'm hyper. You know, I'm, 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 what, I'm, I'm starting to see things like people following me or not. I, I don't know if anybody did or didn't. I was just, at this point, I was totally on edge because I was way out there on this case. And uh, I get to the embassy, and again, it's about three in the morning. And there's a, a fellow in Joe's office, and he's wearing like military, what you call now BDUs. But back in 70, <laughs> the, the, the version of 1972. And he, he's got a bush jacket, and a, very dramatic looking. And I'm introduced to the very first CIA officer I ever met in my life. <laughs> and he says to me, Mike, you're not going to Chiang Mai. And I, why? We can't cover you up there. He said, I didn't know you're covering me anywhere. He said, I, I didn't, I joined this, or I came into this business not to be covered or protected. This is what I've been doing for the last six years, or uh, whatever I've been doing it in. And uh, I didn't expect anything, you know, but Chiang Mai, you're talking about the epicenter possibly of drugs in this world right now, of heroin. I said, these guys are not small time. And, and the guy I'm dealing with here in Bangkok, uh, Gary, it's his, his uncle. So he, Gary believes in me, but he's starting not to believe in me. And... The CIA guy says, you're just not going to Chiang Mai. And finally, he says to me, we have your record. Your military, you understand that you don't know the whole, the big picture. And I had agree. No, no, I don't. And he said, well, we have other priorities. You can't go. And... You know, I was a good soldier. I, I believed. I, I did. I believed it. I, uh, they, they told me to wrap this case up. Uh, and I did. It was written up again. I got a U.S. Treasury Act award because I had managed to identify a man making the false bottom suitcases. I got Gary and Mr. Gare. Uh, they would be tried in Thailand. I had to come back and testify in Thailand. And at the time, they gave me a U.S. Treasury Act award. And I was impressed with myself. I, you know, who, who's going to make what? What could I say? You know, I had to trust the Central Intelligence Agency that they do have other priorities. Now, I'm back in the U.S., and Al Seeley, my boss in customs, says, "You're my, you're my Bangkok man." I became the expert for Bangkok. I said, "Great, boss." A week or two goes by, a month goes by. Seely calls me in. He says, go talk to the, Lou Culver. Lou Culver was a detective, New York detective who had become a customs agent. And a very sharp, very sharp guy. And uh, I think he was in homicide and then he was in uh, burglary, but very, very smart, great investigator. He had an informer, a uh, mulatto fellow who was a GI in, Bank in Thailand, Vietnam, and he had been busted with drugs, and he decided to become an informer. And he started telling Lou a story of drugs being smuggled into the U.S. in the bodies of our KIAs. And it was Lou's case. It wasn't, it wasn't even my case. But when we questioned him more, what I found out was it's the same source. 
the one CIA had just protected from DEA. They were the ones, they were the source of the heroin being smuggled in the dead bodies. Now, all, you, all of your listeners and viewers who have seen these movies that so-called so out the, the, the drug smuggling and the KIAs, it's all BS. None of that happened. The only case where we got close to who, who was doing it and why and how was this one that I'm telling you about right now. All the rest is BS. That is so despicable, though. I mean, that, that's why I wanted it out there, because the idea of, you know, these these soldiers, they die for the country, whether yeah. they were drafted or otherwise. I mean, the insult to it is just beyond uh, all the pale. It, it really I, is. That was just the beginning. Because I kept run, when I got, Then I was transferred to South America, and I ran into them again, doing the same thing, protecting protecting the biggest cocaine traffickers on the face of the earth. And there, that's in my book. I mean, if you're interested, read the books, The Big White Lie and Deep Cover. Uh, did you deal with Frank Lucas during that time? He keeps popping up in the chat. Everybody dealt with Frank Lucas because he, he was like a mid-level drug dealer in New York. He was a fugitive. He was So at different times, if you were in the New York office of DEA, you had to catch something uh, to, come, to go catch Frank Lucas, you know, that, that's all I can remember about it. But I was, I was no big player in the Frank Lucas case. He, it was, uh, you know, there were other guys, but you couldn't help. I mean, DEA was a pretty small office in, in the context of the whole U.S. government. Uh, sure. But DEA, in the context of how many people we were putting in jail, was huge. We were just, <laughs> but we loved it. You, anybody who was a DEA agent in those years and said that job was boring or whatever, you're crazy. That job was, if, if you were an, a, an adrenaline addict like I was, that, mm -hmm. that was that was your ride. You know, they, 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 the homicide detectives say homicide is the big top, but narcotics is the adrenaline ride. They were, they, they were thinking of DEA. <laughs> because that was, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you guys uh, definitely. Your charter was pretty uh, huge. Um, oh God! What you yeah. were supposed to do or not do, and and I definitely want to keep going down that track of especially CIA stuff. I've had on um, Javier Pena and uh, Steve Murphy, and I, I will say, Javier flat out told me that they hated the CIA. Oh yeah, so you're not, you're not the only one. That well, I didn't. That, you know, I have to tell you honestly, I, I have no respect for them. It was a joke. You know, to me, the CIA, I, I, I had, when I had a radio show in New York, I interviewed um, a 25-year career CIA agent, uh, Ralph McGeehy. And Ralph McGeehy was in Vietnam, and he went into the CIA thinking, wow, what, am I, what a job. And he, his words on the air with me were, I, I found them to be completely inept. I found them to be like the second string team that was given all the big equipment and put into the major leagues because they can't, they couldn't do the job. And, he, and that was, that was the best he said about them. And he'd been with them for 25 years when he was in, when, uh, when he was in uh, Vietnam, he contemplated suicide. Wow. Yeah. Well, I've heard you refer to them as prep school. Um, people, <laughs> they're not. You know, if you see a, if you see these movies where CIA agents are undercover and doing that, that doesn't happen. They call agents informers. Well, the informers do. Yeah, it's very confusing. We call DEA an agent is an agent, and the rest are stool pigeons, informers, yeah. snitches. I like stool pigeons. Now, can we break that down, how, how that um, works, just in general? I, I'm guessing you have to use informants to a degree, but I've heard you, you know, describe them, as you said, you know, stool pigeons and all that. I mean, they're, they're criminals. Sure. In essence, in essence, and they're trying to get a better deal. But I'm guessing that you use informants to find your way in to an organization as oh, yeah. an undercover, get the information yeah. to, or intelligence. Is that yeah. the primary purpose? For the first 10 years of DEA, uh, there was what would happen is the informants all had records of 
terrible records, pedophiles, everything you could think of. And then they would become an informant and suddenly they were reborn. You know, suddenly they got religion. And, but that wouldn't work if you had a good defense attorney. So defense attorneys would tear them apart because, they, you know, you had the informant working undercover, not the agent, and cases were being ruined. So prosecutors began calling up DEA with these informant cases and saying, can you duke in, D-U-K in, an undercover? That means a sworn law enforcement officer to get this, to get this dirt bag out. We don't want them on a witness stand. And that's when I, myself and a small cadre of people, that's all we did. We were duped in. We did case after case after case. One day I made four different undercover buys, you know, to work my way in from four different groups in New York City. And and then in the evening, we uh, did a buy bust and arrested like a whole group of six or seven people. But I loved it. You're working 24-7 and you were you were always running on empty. But the undercover, until undercovers started paying the price, getting killed. Then the government became risk averse and suddenly informers in court became Prince Charles. Prince Charles. Okay, I was going to ask you that because yeah. lately we've got a lot of informants in the FBI that are suddenly involved with a kidnapping plot on a governor yes. or certain informants that will happen to be the heads of organizations that um, cause giant problems. And it is just, there, there's a, almost a running narrative and I can't go into details because YouTube will spank me down, but a running yeah. narrative that half of the plots in America are actually generated by said informants. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Informant, gen informant generated entrapment. I mean, if the FBI is at, is at war with mental incompetence and uh, you know, bedwetters and that ilk, they're winning. They're locking up these guys. We're spending millions and millions of taxpayer dollars to lock up the most incompetent bedwetters in the world because they, the informers talk them into sounding like terrorists. It is a joke to us. I mean, to the average DEA guy, you laugh. You said, this is, this is the war on terror? <laughs> but that's what they do. And the individual FBI agent who really can't, he can't cut it. He can't make a case on his own. He can't, you know, you're supposed to they give you a badge, they give you a gun, you're supposed to go out and arrest, catch people committing crimes, not create crimes and then catch people. You don't, you don't create the crime and then arrest, because that's what they're doing. But a lot of FBI agents who come into the government to badge carrying jobs in law enforcement uh, are really not cut out for the, they can't do it. If you fill the whole government with people like that, who are well, well educated, got degrees, they're lawyers, they're, but if you tell them, go enforce the law, stop crime, they can't do it. They have to find an informer. And now, who do they go to? They go to street guys to help make their career. And that's the way it works. Some street guy who's so much quicker than they are. And the next thing you know, they're working for their informant because their informant is giving them a reputation. A career. The trick is they've got to protect the informer because the informer has all the secrets. So they've got to, they've got to, and this unholy, you know, I worked internal affairs for a long time too. And this is what I ran into with DEA agents. Wow. So it's everywhere. Okay. So to pivot back, I know you went and I'm sure there was time in between, but you then went to Argentina or you were stationed for a, a while i think you were station chief down there yeah first i was yeah. first i was sent down there really on a kidnapping uh i i, w I was sent one day i'm driving into manhattan um i'm driving my brand new uh cadillac seized from a drug dealer with a radio club glove compartment and a and a, a teardrop that i could put on a roof and take off and i was like living this fantasy you know <laughs> And I get a, I get a call from the boss, the, the special agent in charge. Uh, the special agent in charge was a felt was a man who actually had fought on Omaha Beach. He's a Marine, so he was he was he was incredible. This guy. Anyway, he called. I get called to his office, and I walk in, and the place is full of people, all strangers. And he says, "Levine, you speak Spanish." 
She says, you're in your record, you speak Spanish. Yes, sir. Tell your wife you're not coming home. Uh, get out to get out to JFK. There's a plane. There's a, Marine. there's a panic, I swear. <laughs> Jim Hunt. His name. Jim, Jim Hunt said, he says, get out to JFK. Have, have your partner go talk to and this happened, this happened a number of times, right? Have your partner go get clothes or whatever that you may need. And uh, my, and my partner went up to, to my house in Rockland County, and my ex-wife, now ex-wife, took my uh, threw all my clothing out on the lawn for him in case. We... <laughs> so I'm on a plane. I don't know where I'm going. And uh, there's 17 other DEA agents on the plane, and we're flying. Four or five hours goes by, and out of the pilot's cabinet comes one of the big DEA bosses, Bob Nikoloff. And uh, he's, he has orders for us. And the orders, we, we get the orders and we find out we're going to Argentina. And hmm. we're going to Argentina to bring back three fugitives from the US who, two of whom never set foot in the US. So this is the first time this is going to, now they call it uh, rendition or something. Rendition. Yeah. This was the very first one in history. And we didn't call it rendition. We called it kidnapping. <laughs> well, terms shift over time. You know, like shell shock was the term in World War One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. became battle fatigue, and then it became PTSD. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I'm all, you, I'm one of I'm one of the last few who lived this. Who was there on that plane? There's still a few. Uh, the thing went to the Supreme Court. So if you if you guys are looking up stuff, it's Francois Chiappi. Miguel Russo and Yolanda Sarmiento. These are the three people we went to Argentina to bring back. And they were all indicted under a major, major conspiracy. I forget if it was Rico then. This might have been a little before Rico or not, but it was a major conspiracy. And as I said, two had never been in the US, but we were bringing them back to the US to stand trial. It was a hell of an experience. When well, I get to Argentina and I meet the Argentine police for the first time, and they have the three the three subjects, the three prisoners, uh, in horse feed bags over their heads, and we bring them into uh, the plane. And uh, the, my my prisoner at that time was uh, uh, Francois Chapi. He was this Corsican who was immense. He was like a bear. They had to have two two sets of handcuffs to. to to get his hand. Yeah, he's just immense. And he says, he says to me, can, can I can I take this off? He said, where do we take off? You could take it off. You know, and uh, the Argentine police who brought him to me in on a plane, the, the Francois says in Spanish, he says, Yes, it was my wallet, my money. And the Argentine cop says to me, he didn't have anything. And then Francois under the bed. He starts laughing, and the blood st spraying out through the bottom of the bag. Uh, yeah, plane takes off to take the bag off Francois Francois's head, Choppy's head, and all his teeth were knocked out. They, oh my god! Yeah, all his teeth with a rifle butt, as it turned out. And Yolanda Sarmiento, the two I sat next to all the way back was Francois Choppy and Yolanda Sarmiento. Yolanda Sarmiento I knew because. Myself and, a, and an agent named Hector Santiago investigated her maybe two years before when, when uh, we were customs or no, this is one of the customs. We investigated her, what her and uh, Miguel Russo, her husband did. They allegedly had one of their customers uh, for cocaine, they were cocaine dealers. One of their customers, I forget exactly why, but they killed him and cut him up in pieces in a hotel in Manhattan. This became part of the indictment for them. So this is a little old lady, and she had cut this guy. And I have that in my the imagery in my mind. And she's destroyed, wrecked because her the police killed her son. And yeah. and all she all she could do all she could do is cry and think about her son. But then I'm looking at her and I'm uh, realizing that this is the woman who, with her husband, at least one body that I know of, because there was proof in the room. So here I am, oddly enough, sitting next to Yolanda Sarmiento on a plane, going back, trying to get conversation out of her. And all she could do was cry. 
Well, we get back to New York. <clears throat> All of us is uh, surprisingly little hullabaloo, you know, in the press, which I really, I had to believe that for some reason uh, they put the, the cone of silence on top of this whole thing. But it happened, and I have the uh, the Supreme Court decision on this when they try to claim they were kidnapped. Uh, so mm -hmm. those are your legal files. Go up, Francois Chiappi, Miguel Russo, and Yolanda Sarmiento. You'll find it as a Supreme Court decision. They they wouldn't they did not grant the case certiorari, saying basically it was not kidnapping. There's no evidence that it was kidnapping. So they they didn't take the case. They yeah didn't. they wouldn't. Uh, they didn't take it. Yeah, never mind. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> Yeah, no, 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 I'm not. There's but, been a lot of that. Lately, really, the, the story really is when Yolanda calls me from jail and says that uh, one of the guards offered for 25000 to put her on the street. Now we cut to my, we, we ran through a whole undercover scenario with her, not me. I gave it to a, a special unit. But I was there to get Yolanda when she came out of prison because they broke her out. They took the 25,000 and broke her out. And so I, I, wow. she came out of the, the federal detention headquarters in lower, lower Manhattan. I guess still, they, get, they got her a wig and I wa watched her walk out with the crowd of visitors and she came right to my car like she was supposed to. But it's a long convoluted story, but that's the way it happened. Wow, that, that is, that's amazing. Yeah, All right, yeah. So I look back. I mean, look, I look back on my whole life and think, did that happen? Did that really happen? <laughs> you know, the funny thing is I'm a disabled vet and I, I'm getting PTSD uh, treatment from the VA and most of it comes from the NDEA agent. <laughs> insane, insane. Wow. Um, yeah, this is why I, I really wanted to spend some time and talk to you through this stuff. And uh, obviously I'm not going to... I think I told you ahead of time. I'm not going to be able to get through even half no, of it. No. If you, 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 you've got to come back. We've got yeah. to agree. You've got to agree no. to come back already. Sure. Um, I want to go into one more thing to kind of wrap up this session. Sure. And because it gets into Argentina and Bolivia, Klaus Barbie, and yeah. back to, and you know what? I'm sure you're familiar with Operation Paperclip. Oh yeah. And CIA yeah. really likes their. Uh, I can't say the word out loud because I get censored on YouTube, but they like those World War II Germanic figures very, very much. Or in Argentina? Let me tell you, I'm, this, I was stationed there. Yeah. Yeah. That means I lived, I lived in Buenos Aires, and I, from Buenos Aires, I was working undercover all over the place, but I worked very closely with uh, what you, I guess you would call it the Argentine secret police, because mm -hmm. these were the guys who, they were basically serial killers. They were killing uh, their own citizens. If you had a reputation for being leftist, you were gone. Not only were you gone, your family was gone, and oh, they, they they quickly had no terror. In, they had no acts of terror in no time once they instituted that kind of tactic. Uh, think about that. I, you know, I don't think that's right. I think it's you know really horrible, but that's what happened. Um, they. I would pay them. You know, these were called special operation units for DEA. And they came in and got paid. They got a salary. That was all illegal but the, for them. But they got a salary. So I became it, very comfortable with me. I speak their language. I, you know, they were just very comfortable with me. And they, they talked and I, uh, told me anything I want to know. They, they talked about the, the, the killings that they were doing with me. It was... That, it's a whole four more shows if you want to do it. But a lot of this is in The Big White Lie. I wrote it. I'm not just talking about it. I wrote it. It was documented. It was checked by a, a, a legion of lawyers uh, in what they call a libel reading before it was published, both Deep Cover and The Big White Lie. Deep Cover became a New York Times bestseller, yet I thought it would affect the government, that somebody, Congress, would do something. But no, 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 not a thing. So I lost all hope, or well, lost the hope in that I could change anything, not a damn thing, because you don't put some of the stuff that I did in writing without some reaction. Call me a liar. Let's talk about the facts in the book. You know, I'm an expert at putting together conspiracy cases. 
Conspiracy theorist? Yeah. No, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a professional. A conspiracy practitioner. I'm a conspiracy <laughs> professional. I put thousands of Americans and others in jail for conspiracy. That's not a theorist. I go to court and prove conspiracy. Right. It's easy. People, the media doesn't know that. They call conspiracy theorists. No. Nah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm going to start crying soon. <laughs> Uh, I know I I hear you. It it's mind blowing, and I've I've discovered that more and more because I look at um, I, I brought up MK Ultra, Operation Paperclip, all, all of these things. Oh, I forgot to tell you. What I forgot to tell you is these yeah. friends, these Argentine secret police who got close to me. They know I'm a Jew, so one of them says to me, "Hey, you know Mengele? You know who Mengele is?" I said, "Yeah." He said, well, he's got an apartment right here in Buenos Aires. You want to come over and see it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I, I just laughed like he's joking or something. But then I contacted the so-called Nazi hunters and uh, nothing ever became of it. You know, I, maybe they considered me or not. But that's what they were saying to me. And, and uh, Eichmann lived a very short distance from where I lived. Wow. Wow. And then, of course, you had Klaus Barbie. And Cla well, Klaus Barbie yeah. was in, in the, the case in the big white lie. He was in it. He, he, the uh, cocaine barons, the La, La, La Mafia Cruceña, they call it in, in Bolivia. This immense mafia that was at that time responsible for maybe 90 percent of the cocaine on the Earth's surface. You know, uh, they were selling raw base, uh, what they call uh, the 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 uh, the cocaine base cocaine to the right. Colombians. Colombians were trying. Colombia was just a factory. The source of it was Bolivia, and the, was there Peru as well? I thought there was some coca grown in Peru. Yeah, Peru too. too. That grows it, but Bolivia. Nobody was even near Bolivia in these years. And okay. the fact is, DEA could have taken him down and was stopped by Central Intelligence. And you have to read the book to see. My proof, okay. yeah, because <laughs> because Roberto Suarez was a central intelligence asset, and he had to be protected. Why? They were anti-communist. The drug dealers were anti-communist. Anti-drug was the Lydia Gala government of Bolivia. So the Lydia Gala government had to go down, even though they were anti-drug, but they were leftists. Mm. And that's the choice they make all over the globe right now. Pakistan, Afghanistan, who's anti, who is anti-drug? It's all BS. Uh, the, uh, the drug dealers in Pakistan are immensely powerful. They're anti-Taliban. They're anti-Islamic uh, radicals. They are allies. You can't take them down. It's not only for you guys, you Americans, you believe this. That's not it's ridiculous to even think that this is even a possibility. That's our only assets over there. That's our allies. They're, they're truly anti-Islamic terrorism because the Islamic terrorists, I mean, they're animals, they're roaches. Uh, but the thing is, they're anti-drug dealer. Mm. <laughs> you want to make them DEA agents? <laughs> That's the reality of the world, Eric. <laughs> insane, insane. Now, to wrap up this session, Yes, sir. Um, and by request, this is uh, Robert Barnes, and Robert Barnes is actually who recommended that I seek you out. Yeah, he's um, talking about a, peanut butter sandwich. Yeah, he yeah. wants. Yeah, that's a hell of a tale. So, on that tale, can yeah. you tell just the first half? Because there's a punchline that's going to come in the next episode too. But peanut but, butter sandwich. Peanut butter sandwich. sandwich. Yeah. Uh, Santi Barrio is a, a DEA agent who worked for me in New York. He's, he, he, he married an, an embassy secretary, became a DEA agent in Italy. He was this super handsome, multilingual guy, uh, and he quickly got a reputation as a world-class undercover agent, worked for CIA, worked for everybody in the world who wanted this guy. who was really something out of a movie, but he was a DEA agent. And I'm in Argentina. I get word that Santi Barrio was arrested by DEA Internal Affairs for smuggling heroin into the United States across the Mexican border. And he's put into jail on a, uh, I forget the jail, but a jail on 
ask, uh, ask, ask Mr. Barnes. So he'll, he'll probably have a better memory of the names and places. Uh, the, uh, so he's in, he's in jail, and I can't believe it. I knew Santi Barrio extremely well. You know, I knew what he would do and he wouldn't do, but I could not believe he would, he would be so dumb to smuggle drugs. Uh, what really happened, because I, I went to dinner with his, his uh, I went to dinner with his wife long after this happened, uh, his, his, uh, his ex-wife and, uh, oh, what the hell is it? The attorney from the Kerry Commission who became a friend of Jack Bloom. Uh, and we had this private little dinner and talking about all of this. And Santi was not a guy, he, we couldn't believe he did this. And as it turns out, he was cleared posthumously. Uh, what, what happened is he took a bite of a peanut butter sandwich one day while in jail, waiting to go to trial. And all of us who knew Santi were waiting to see what truths would come out. Holy crap, this guy knew where everything was buried. You know, they, they really gonna put him on trial? Well, he takes a bite of a peanut butter sandwiches, falls down in convulsions, goes into a coma. First, the, the uh, first physical examination uh, results in findings that he had strychnine in, in his blood. That disappeared. He subsequent, uh, and nobody ever investigated this, subsequent investigations or subsequent lab tests or whatever they did, because nobody knows what they really did, came out, came out that nothing, he didn't have anything in his blood, that he choked on his peanut butter sandwich. Uh -huh. Well, well, that became, in DEA, and I think that's what <laughs> Mr. Barnes was talking about, uh, is it Art Barnes? Is it? Mm -hmm. Art Barnes. No, Robert Barnes. Robert Barnes. I, I, I know him. I know I know him. And, uh, so, so I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, the uh, picture there, I don't know if you can see it. But he'll screen. tell you that this the saying in, in DEA all over was when you started to go against the powers that be, watch out for a peanut butter sandwich. And now, I don't know if that still lives in DEA, but for all the years I was in, that's what people said to me. Watch out for a peanut butter sandwich, Mike. And that would, that's the reality. You can't make this stuff up. It's just too real, too scary. Too much, it's too much in my bones. I, I'll just keep to, I don't care whether people, actually I don't care if people believe me or not. <laughs> it, just, it just is. And well, that's uh, perfect, perfect. if you doubt me, read the facts in the book and find a single fact that you question in the book. And if you don't, then you know I'm right. All right. Well, that's a perfect place to wrap up this session because there's so much more that I want to get into that goes into Iran Contra, everything, your career through the 80s. Um, I forgot her name. Uh, Sonia. Uh, Sonia Atala. Yes. Sonia Atala. Yeah. All these people. There's so much stuff coming up and I definitely want to give that room and um, very much all the way through Gary Webb as well. I well, know. Yeah. you know, that's part of the trouble that I have just remembering individual names is because there's so many. It's like, God almighty, uh, there was there was no quiet moment in my life. Okay, well, and we're going to be hearing about these very soon. So Okay. Today. Thank you so, so much. And okay, my friend. Excited.